Okay, Excellencies, distinguished guests, MEIG faculty, professors and practitioners of all international organizations in Geneva and around the world, dear supervisors uh, of uh, our participants in the different entities based in Geneva and in Rome, in Brussels, staff members, dear graduates, I am privileged and proud to open this graduation ceremony of the MEIG program 2019 in the presence of uh, many personalities and in particular of Mr. Michael Muller, uh, former Director uh, General of the United Nations Office at Geneva, who was with us during the launch of this program in February 2017. Thank, so thank you for being with us uh, tonight. So today it's a great celebration, of course, because it marks the end of the education program uh, at the University of Geneva for all of you. And this is, of course, an important event, important event for you, graduates, but it's also an important event for your parents, family, friends, and even for the professors who were with you and associated to this program during uh, a full uh, year, not only in Geneva in this building of uh, our university, but also in Brussels in the European Union institutions, uh, also in the different entities in Geneva. So it was really uh, a pleasure to, um, to share all these moments uh, with you. Um, it is also a special day because you are the third edition of the program, the third edition, uh, third promotion uh, of this program, uh, which is unique in the way that it brings together European and global governance in one, uh, in one education uh, cur curriculum at university level. Most of the time you have either European governance or international governance. Rarely both of them are mixed in one, uh, uh, in one program. And the main, uh, I would say, the main red line of all the program is Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. So we go through all this, through the different topics, through the different fields, from the perspective of governance at regional and global level. As we know, today globalized world presents new challenges. We, we know about mass migration, about the risk of trade system, about uh, the threats and the new threats to security, to international security and peace, um, climate change, uh, just to mention uh, a few of them. So the aim of the, of the program is to provide the participants a uh, deep understanding on political, sociological, uh, legal and political aspect of governance at a multi-level system. So we look at the national level of these uh, governance at the regional and at the international. So program, I must say, is also the result of a unique cooperation between the university and uh, so the academic in general and the professional world. And this is really one of the focus uh, in, in this program, a professionalizing program, and it's a result of a cooperation between the University of Geneva and the United Nations Office uh, uh, here in Geneva. So it brings together people from the university with practitioners in the different fields, and uh, we started, uh, yesterday we started the fourth edition of the program, and uh, we uh, welcomed 25 participants from 20 different countries. So a uh, very warm welcome to the new cohort of the MEIG program, which is also present uh, tonight and will be sharing uh, experiences with the uh, graduates of, of tonight. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, come back uh, to our graduates of tonight, uh, of tonight 
I hope that the diploma was uh, allowing you to acquire the fundamentals in the different fields of governance, in migration, in human rights, in peace and security, and trade and development, and all these things, and that you acquired better knowledge of these aspects in governance, and you are uh, with better skills now in order to boost your career in the different field of your uh, professional um, future. Whether you are already in office or likely to be in a near future, you are definitely more and better equipped to handle with everyday affairs and to manage the, uh, um, the different uh, challenges that you will have to uh, overcome during your professional life. I wish you the very best for the future and I look forward to hearing from you uh, about your success career, about uh, your uh, good stories, and uh, already now, congratulations to all of you. I will now um, invite uh, our dean, the dean of the law faculty, to say a few words uh, in the name of the of, uh, university authorities, and uh, as you know, this program is combined between the law faculty uh, of the university and the Global Studies Institute. So there are two entities within the university. And uh, I am uh, very pleased to give the floor to uh, Professor Benedict Foy. Please, Benedict, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, Mr. Director, dear program participants, dear families, dear faculty members, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I would like to extend a warm welcome to everybody on behalf of the University of Geneva Faculty of Law. I would like also to say congratulations to all of you, dear participants. You have followed a challenging, interesting, and demanding program with success. I'm sure you enjoyed taking classes, reading assignments, discussing issues with your climate, uh, classmates and your professors. But still, you had to work, and it was hard work. And to finish the program with success is quite an achievement. So congratulations to all of you. You are now well armed to face the challenges of your professional lives in an international environment. As Professor Cadus pointed out, you are the third group to receive the MEIG diploma and a fourth group has started uh, its curriculum yesterday. This shows that the MEIG is a well-established program. It is acquiring a degree of maturity which is quite respectable. It also sh shows that the recipe for this program is a success. It is the result of a wonderful cooperation between the University of Geneva and La Genève Internationale, as it is called. We can be proud and happy about this cooperation. This great program has now, uh, in a sense, uh, new ambassadors, your group, the 2019 graduates. I congratulate you again, just as I thank you professors, the staff members, as well as your directors, professors uh, Christine Cadouz and Nicolas Levra. And I wish you the best for your future wherever your path will lead you. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Dean, for your uh, kind words on the program and on the graduates. Uh, unfortunately, Nicolas Levra, my colleague and co-director of this program for the third edition, is not with us tonight. 
but uh, he is with us in mind and uh, he of course uh, congratulates you as well for all uh, what uh, you have done and achieved during this year. Now um, I'm, I'm uh, going to uh, give the floor to uh, Mrs. Lydia Grigoreva. Uh, she is uh, representing the United uh, Nations Office at Geneva. So uh, she is tonight the representative of this cooperation you heard of, uh, this wonderful cooperation. Uh, we are uh, very grateful that uh, uh, you are with us uh, and we have many persons of UNOG tonight with us and uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, sharing this moment with us. You have the floor. Thank you, Professor Kadus. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and privilege to be, uh, for me to be here with you. On behalf of the United Nations Office at Geneva, I warmly congratulate the faculty members parents, uh, family members, and of course the graduating students with the successful completion of the third edition of the Master of Advanced Studies in European and International Governance, MAKE program. The UN Office in Geneva is proud to have collaborated with the University of Geneva on this program, from the development of the modules to identifying experts and practitioners to um, hosting students as interns at the Office of the Director General, this has been a fruitful partnership which has started, as was already mentioned, by the former Director General of UNOG, Michael Muller, and which is going to continue in the future. MAKE program, which combines both theory and practice, offers an immersion in how global governance tackles the multitude of the current global challenges. De um, designed for graduates and professionals from all over the world, MAKE program is firmly rooted in international Geneva and home to international organizations, representatives of states, NGOs, a rich private sector, scientific community, and academic institutions. International Geneva is the operational hub of the multilateral system and the best place to see innovative multilateralism in action. You, dear graduates, must have uh, all seen this through your studies. Today you know more about trade, about the environment, human rights, sustainable development, and the work of the United Nations and other international organizations. What you also know is that international relations are defined not only by crisis, conflict, or um, antagonism. The global challenges are also global opportunities, and they can only be addressed collectively. And whatever next steps you will be taking in the area of global governance, as was already mentioned by Professor Kadus, it is the 2030s agenda for sustainable development which serves as a global and local roadmap for action. If we meet the sustainable development goals, we will manage to resolve many of the problems uh, plugging the world today. Poverty, um, gross inequalities, discrimination against women and girls, climate change, and a rapidly deteriorating natural environment. The SDG summit that concluded yesterday under the auspices of the General Assembly in New York saw a clear renewal of the commitment <coughs> by leader after leader to implement the 2030 agenda and a real determination to get back on track, which is what is also recognized is that at the moment we are very far from uh, the track to achieve the go global goals on time. The Secretary General issued a global appeal for a, a decade of action to deliver the goals by 2030. So you all have a lot of work to do. Dear graduates, on the way here at the, in the tram with Francesco, I was recalling how uh, my own feelings and the state of mind when I was graduating from my master's in human rights 17 years ago, and how um, the only certainty I had at that moment was the absence of any certainty. What will the future look like, and what is my place in that future? Um, I'm sure many of you are today asking the same questions. And I wish someone told me a couple of things back then. I wish someone told me uh, not to lock myself mentally in the area of my studies, but to continue exploring, to looking around, and to being curious about everything. The world now is changing at such a fast pace that it's much harder now to respond to the question, which I used to hate then, and I still hate, is where will you see yourself in 10 years? If you clearly see yourself somewhere in 10 years, there might be a problem. Because this vision will lock you and uh, hijack you and not let you look around and find something else. The truth is you cannot even know anything uh, that long from now 
especially not anymore. We don't even know what kind of jobs will exist in 10 years. I also wish someone told me not to be afraid to make mistakes, because you can only learn and progress from your own mistakes. Nobody can teach you that. And finally, I wish someone told me um, to break the rules and not just think outside the box, but to throw the box away. <laughs> Mr. Merler told me that afterwards, but I was already a grown-up person. <laughs> <laughs> and if you allow me, on the final note, I will just conclude with a quote from uh, Oscar Wilde, who said brilliantly, in my view, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. So congratulations and good luck. Thank you for this very nice speech, and uh, we have to throw the box away. It's the best solution, apparently. Um, okay, thank you so much for, for these uh, nice words. Um, I just I don't want to be too long, huh? so it's not the main issue. So the idea now, I'm not going to talk and present every speaker uh, in a long way. So, But I am very privileged and pleased to welcome Ambassador Yannick Hula. Uh, representing the Swiss mission and the missions in Geneva, which is, of course, one of the stakeholders within the program. And we are going and we go very often to visit different missions and uh, discuss different topics. So thank you for being with us, Excellency. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, dear Professor Foy and dear Professor Cadus, Excellencies, the representatives of the UN, Mr. Pisano, Madame Grigoreva, Dear graduates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, let me also congratulate all of you uh, for your successful completion of the Master in European and International Governance. This is an important step in your professional and academic career, so really congratulations to all of you. I would like also to thank uh, Professor Cadus and her team, uh, not only for giving me the opportunity to say a few words tonight, but for leading this excellent program of study, which represents an important bridge between the University of Geneva and what we call the International Geneva. As you know, International Geneva is a vibrant ecosystem composed of more than 40 international organizations now, 179 states represented here by a permanent mission, around 700, uh, 750, uh, 750 NGOs, world-class academic institutions, as well as the headquarters of dozens of major private companies. You have here more than 28,000 civil servants working here, and around 220,000 delegates coming from the whole world every year to participate to international conferences or meetings. Switzerland is proud to provide, through this city, a unique uh, space where experts, practitioners, leaders and policymakers can exchange on a daily basis. Geneva has become over the years one of the main hubs where global policies are discussed, adopted and assessed. Notably in traditional areas of diplomacy like trade, global health, intellectual property, labor, human rights or humanitarian affairs, but also in new fields like uh, digital policies. Our ambition is to continue to develop it as a major global governance center where innovative solutions are fostered and implemented. As observers and actors of international relations, we all witness nowadays a process of, of profound change with the emergence not only of a fragmented world and stronger criticisms to the current multilateral system, but also of very quick technological developments, their convergence, and their large-scale application. This phenomenon, together with globalization, has a deep impact on our societies and is transforming the way we live and cooperate. New networks and new stakeholders also appear on the international arena, such as giant tech companies, transnational political movements, or cities and local governments, which play an increasing role in global governance and are key in the implementation of the Agenda 2030. Other fundamental trends which shape the foundations of societies worldwide in terms of demographics, environment, or trade patterns. A new international order is emerging, but its shape is still undefined and evolving. In all these emerging issues, International Geneva is at the forefront of the current transformation. It is the laboratory of tomorrow's multilateralism. This is why I believe that a program of study such as yours is of fundamental importance. We need to have more interactions between academic research and policymaking, between science and diplomacy. 
Practitioners need to stay constantly updated on the latest academic knowledge and benefit also from the new ways of thinking. And at the same time, academics need to be informed of the developments happening on the international stage and to understand the functioning of and dynamics of the international governance system. This is why Switzerland supports also various platforms for cooperation whose goals are to link different actors like international organizations, NGOs, states, private sector, as well as academics. Just to name one, the Geneva Science Policy Interface, which is hosted here by the University of Geneva, and whose aims is to, at, uh, to facilitate effective solutions to complex problems through enhanced scientific engagement of global governance actors within the Geneva ecosystem. I trust your daily activities will benefit greatly from the knowledge acquired here during your stay uh, at the University of Geneva, and, had, and that it has allowed you to better understand how things work, the challenge you are facing, and that it will also help you to bring your own contribution to new solutions to overcome these challenges. I thank you all for your attention, and I wish you all really all the best for, the, for your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I think really the bridge between, between the university and the practitioners uh, is very important, and there are many initiatives which are discussed and put into place now in Geneva uh, about also this platform for the incubators, uh, which is really uh, one of the good initiatives um, for the time being. Well, um, we are now um, going to move to the uh, phase uh, of the um, guest speaker and the conference of today. So um, I am very pleased that Dr. Uh, Francesco Pisano accepted to be our guest speaker for this graduation ceremony. Uh, Dr. Pisano is um, uh, a former Italian diplomat. For those who don't know uh, Dr. Pisano, so former Italian diplomat a uh, specialist of uh, international affairs, uh, risk management, uh, humanitarian affairs, and um, started in the UN uh, almost as a child, 26 years ago, uh, in different positions uh, in the UN, and since 2016, he is leading the uh, uh, UN Library, which is also a center for research and education, which was established in 1919. And 1919, of course, we are in the century uh, for the anniversary of multilateralism. So it uh, was, of course, quite logical to choose the topic of today, multilateralism and post-globalization. Francesco, you have the floor. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Professor Caduce. Just one thing, I've never been an Italian diplomat. I served uh, as an expert for the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Italy when I was uh, a little bit more than a child out of university, doing my master's at that time. So first of all, thank you to the University of Geneva, to MEIG, uh, to, to the Global Center, to the faculty. Thank you to all of you for inviting me here. It's, uh, it's truly humbling for me to be the guest speaker of such a ceremony. Um, but uh, basically, I'm here for you, uh, and with my presence, all I want to do in 20 minutes is the time I was given, and it's 7 or 2 now, so I will finish at 22 promptly, is uh, what I want to do with my presence is to honor, afterwards. and there is a discussion, is to honor your effort, to honor your commitment to what we call global governance, multilateralism. You, I have heard, uh, especially in Ambassador Roulin's um, uh, remarks, uh, key words that we all say, that we all write, that we all hear and repeat. I'm here to honor your commitment to this idea. I will speak about the idea a little bit, but you're the experts of the idea. I'll take you for a straw in what we haven't seen yet. And uh, I'm here to share the little I know about multilateralism. Um, I'm just the director of the biggest library of multilateralism in the world but I haven't read all the books. 
So you probably know more about, about that. And you know, as these graduation speeches are supposedly to be inspirational and motivational, of course, if you compare this with the one Steve Jobs gave at Harvard, I'm failing. But I feel inspired by being here. I am feel inspired by you because I've been in this job for 30 years of international relations. And seeing you striving to acquire knowledge for me is, uh, is inspiring. So here's the first inspirational thing for you. The superpower of humans is not knowledge. It's imagination. So if you want to get your superpower out, you have to start imagining things. Because what you know has happened before, what is happening now. It has not happened in the future yet. So this is very important. This superpower is so great that many men and women of power don't even dare using it because it's really a superpower. And I'm telling you this in the t very temple of knowledge, a university. God protect me. But I will catch myself up later on, you will see. So I want to be a little bit thought provoking for you because otherwise it's seven, you will fall asleep, you find this boring. So here's my contention that I prepare for you today. My contention, which is not only for today, is my contention every day, and I know that there are colleagues here and diplomats. This is after hours. I'm here on my free time, and I'm not speaking on behalf of my organization. My contention is that we have already transitioned into post-globalization, however you want to define that era. It's not the previous era. And what we are experiencing now is a phase of adjustment in which we rush, panic a little bit, hold on to old things, project ourselves in the future, trying to do what? To adapt and adjust what we have, what we know, what we've been taught in universities, which is all in the past and in the present, to what is coming at us at increasing speed. That is my contention, that we are already in a new era, except we're not declaring it to ourselves. Psychologists call it denial. Let's call it lack of immediate situational awareness. It's more academic. So, that's the contention, all right? Now, let's step back and take a look at the big picture, what we have here. So the big picture seen from my perspective is that we are possibly at the peak of our civilization. If you look back 4,000 years, we never had so much money, so much wealth, so much technology, so much cars, so whatever you calculate, you may say there may be more coming Maybe. But let's say that for now, we are at the peak of the civilization. And we got here through a process of intensive globalization that relied on an idea that is as old as Marco Polo, that of globalism. Now, if you still confuse globalism, globalization, get that straight because it's very important when you play with global governance. They're two different things. Now, globalization is the methodology that we used to grow. We could have taken any path, but our path was to grow through economy, finance, drilling, consuming, plasticking, whatever. We chose that path. It was not sent to us by some gods in another galaxy. And so here's the thing. Globalization, as we have managed it in the past two centuries, has now created a cost. There is a cost that was hidden to us until very recently. So it's created what we call in the UN global challenges. To be clear, we're losing the oceans and the atmosphere, right? These global challenges are driven by globalization. They do not happen on themselves. Now, here's the thing for you. Global governance as a set of systems, procedures, and practices has been designed to manage our race to globalization. And now we're asking it to solve the consequence of it. Do I need to repeat that? Globalization drives global challenges, but global governance is designed to help globalize faster consume and drill and not to solve the consequences. Sort of like asking the car industry to solve the problem of parking shortages. And so here where we are now, and what's multilateralism all this? Well, multilateralism, I will not talk a lot about multilateralism as it is now, because you know it better than I do. But let's say multilateralism, for me, 
is the algorithm on which this global governance app runs. And a lot of people talk about it. I also talk about it as immune system of the international society, the international collective. It's true, it's an immune system. If we abuse multilateralism, we're going to catch sicknesses. We cannot predict which ones or when, but our health will decrease. So, I won't talk a lot, but there are certain things that I spotted in multilateralism in my studies that I want to share with you. First of all, multilateralism is not a diplomatic practice, just that. It's much more because multilateralism is, is, relies on a set of values and on a shared willingness to respect rules. So you cannot talk about multilateralism trading horses if you do not respect the values on which it relies. Mind you, this happens in foreign policy confrontations. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that multilateralism has never been a recipe for harmony. So as soon as there is a disharmonization of the system, if that word exists in English, people start shooting at the UN or global processes or whatever you want to call them. Nobody said that multilateralism is a recipe for harmony. Multilateralism is a conscious effort by state actors and other stakeholders to harmonize differing and often conflicting interests. It's a sort of moral discipline for nation states. So it's not a recipe, it's a sort of discipline. Now, when you look at it like that, for someone like me, it's the obvious choice if you want to give collective responses to big issues. It's so obvious that one shouldn't be here telling you that multilateralism is the way to go. And today, this algorithm, this set of values and rules, is enshrined in the UN Charter and nowhere else. That's why we owe Mama UN respect and protection, because we don't have another one. You remember my former Secretary General said, there's no planet B. There's no UN B, he should have said, because we haven't designed it yet. So this is the one we have. This is the chapter we have, and this is the chapter we should protect until we get a new one, maybe. So if multilateralism is so you know, obvious, why isn't it working? because it isn't working very properly, otherwise we wouldn't have all the situations that we are having, and Ambassador Rulan mentioned a few. Well, to continue with the, 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 the parable of the algorithm, it's not working properly because we are running our processes on a very old version of this software. It's a version that serves us well. I will say a little bit about that in, uh, in a in a, in a second, but we're hanging on it and we're at the same time criticizing it and criticizing the home of it, the UN, and the participants in the game. Whereas we should just say things have moved and now we need a newer version. You don't try to use Windows 97 to run your apps, do you? So, what has changed? The reality has gone polylateral. So you will study all these ten, hundreds of our multilaterals, but your reality is polylateral. Because the players are not defining the list that you find your book, in your book. They're so nice and clean. These are the list. These are the players. These are those who have the authority, let's talk about accountability also, to participate in the game. And the power distribution that was so clear and simple like it or not, has become polycentric. So how do you deal with the polylateral reality with the distribution of power that is polycentric? I don't know, you are the expert, but what I know is that the first thing you go, you run to your code and you revise your algorithm. So it's really like that. It's really like you try to tour Tokyo with a 1954 map. And then what you do, you criticize the town because it doesn't match your map. That's a very clever thing to do. So what are we doing? We're faced with this that some people are starting to see in academic circles more than diplomatic circles. What we do is we resort to what we do best, sitting very still. 
sitting very still. But there is a catch, because there is something else that has changed in the last century, is that times accelerate, and things go faster. And so if we sit still, we won't find a solution, because the time, the deadline, is coming to us. It moves towards us. And that is why, seen from the diplomatic so you see all these calls from the civil society, all quarters of the, the planet, the youth, the old, whatever, saying, you know, wake up, wake up. And these calls today are directed mainly to state actors. Why? Because they are recognized as the key players, but no longer as bowing to them, but as do something because we rely on you. Some of these countries are starting to shift on their feet because they feel the pressure of these calls. Something is off, right? But mostly, I must say, are still sitting very tight. I don't want to give you a, a pessimistic impression. I, I'm not a pessimist. Actually, I'm an optimist. And so I would like to infuse some of that onto you. We truly, as the ambassador said, we're starting to see a new model. There is a new model coming up from the horizon. We are seeing it in many things. We're not helping it to be born because this is what humans do. They hang on to what they know now. But if we use a little bit of imagination, we can work this out very neatly if the oceans don't get lost before we manage. And here's the thing. The old model served us very well. Nobody's saying that we should throw it. So there are things that the old model, the old architecture of multilateral, multilateralism has, has done that we can build on. So this is not about revolution. This is about evolution. But every time in our history, we denied evolution, we caused revolution. Any history book can teach you that. So we can build on it, but we can no longer rely on a system that tells us that the world order is a consequence, a direct consequence, of set power dynamics. Because polylateralism now is much more complex than that. You don't have only soft power, hard power, dark power, if you want to be intellectually advanced. But these are the three powers, right? There is much more. You know it. We all know it. So the new model resembles to something that actually we know and we use in our other fields of activities that are not global governance. And what are these models? If you set up a company, you start consulting with consumers before you do your products. You are consultative. If you launch a course, you start interrogating your potential beneficiaries on you know, what their learning requirements are you're being participatory. So this is not rocket science. We have done it. We're doing it all the time. So the new system of multilateralism will have to be like that. Otherwise, we'll lose the race. We'll have to be inclusive, participatory. We'll have to rely on system thinking and be networked as a network of knowledge systems. And here, mind you, including also non-humans. Because there are entire systems of knowledge, as a librarian can tell you, that are managed by algorithms. So how do we leverage that if not through networks? Because you cannot um, invite an AI to a meeting of member states to a convention. Some people say you can, but we'll see when we get there. So the other thing that the new system has to look into is a more sophisticated pact at planet level. So here is when you will start thinking I'm crazy. But listen, we live in symbiosis with a planet. We're living, for, living forms on a planet. We're actually a minority, seen from the point of view of fishes, ants, birds. Just because they don't speak your language, you think they have no rights? So we are a minority. We took over this place. But this place never signed off on any of this. This place, the Earth never signed off saying, yeah, globally, accelerated globalization based on industrial economy is good. So what we need, we need something that we did long ago. 
long, long ago, like maybe 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, a pact with the system. So how much can I get out of this before I deplete the system? So maybe you think this is crazy. Um, maybe. But we already done it. This. This Agenda 2030 is the precursor of what we left tomorrow that will constitute the fabric of the new model of multilateralism. Consultative, participatory agreements that don't need to be legally binding, that put responsibility on each and every one of you, because multilateralism is you, is me, together with state actors and institutions and regional commissions and whatnot. But it's us. So we've done it already. We know that we can do it. Someone who was in the summit in September 2015 told me it's the shortest, it took the shortest time to adopt this than any other agreement in the UN. Why? Perhaps I want to have hope, because it was obvious. Perhaps because someone in that room was feeling that this is going towards the future. Agenda 2030 is the most advanced preview of modern multilateralism I've seen so far. Two things it has that will be found in agreements going forward. It sets ambitious goals. Meaning, remember what I told you in the beginning? It lets people imagine a better future. We have done this for millennia. We have imagined a better future for us, and that's how we built a better world. Starting from the fire, with the wheel, and with the you know, electric vehicle, whatever. It's imagination. So Agenda 2030 does that. It gives a vision, imagine a vision for all of us in the future. And so it resembles much more, in my opinion, what's to come rather than what has been. Agenda 2030 in the declaratory phase, unfortunately, a lot of people only talk about the SDGs and the stop there. But if the, the most exciting part of Agenda 2030 is the declaration of principles. That you have to read before you go to bed. And then when you wake up, you read it again. Because it's, very, it's the first time that the world said, we want no more poor, and, and, and so on and so on, 17 times. It's huge. In my opinion, it's huge. So we are on a journey to the new. This, this is the optimistic part that I want to give you. And you're part of that. And you take responsibility, because now you're experts in global governance. And so this journey, like all journeys, contains hopes, aspirations, and fears. We have fears, and these fears are blocking us. There are speed bumps on this journey that we all know, and I'm going to list them for you so you remember. The, the speed bump that is coming at us from time to time, and it's the, the, the weirdest one is inequalities. We're producing inequalities, as we go, faster than we produce well-being. And inequalities, our number one cause of conflict, hatred, and whatever else sickness and illness in the, in the global community we know. The second speed bump is, is our progressive divorce from nature. We're divorcing from nature, and she's not liking it. And she's going to hit back at us. The third is that we denied the cost of the globalization that we wanted. We deny them. We take walk around so that we can justify it. Number one justification is economic growth. We need to grow. It took a 15 years old to say, hey, my teacher told me that one, nothing can grow in, in, ad infinitum. It was a year and a half ago. Her name is Greta. And the, the other speed bump, in my opinion, is the fears we have of reshaping the global uh, governance. We are scared on opening up the machine called global governance and look inside. And inside, there are a couple of things that we should look at. One is consensus. Consensus as we use it, ladies and gentlemen, is engineered to bring the agreement ambitions down, 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 until everyone says, OK, yeah, I can sign on that. The second is submitting scientific facts to political discourse. This you could do until the late Middle Ages. It's not a peak of civilization attitude to continue. Facts are facts. Political discourse is political discourse. 
Those are the speed bumps. Now there are accelerators we can use to throttle up and go faster on this journey because you remember the catch. Time accelerates, oceans are uh, failing us. The first accelerator is togetherness. Until we understand togetherness, we will not be able to leverage us. The most basic form of togetherness is gender. We live in a world that for centuries refused consciously to use half of the gray matter available to us. There is a word for that. I'll let you imagine it. So togetherness is the true, the true nature of consensus. Because the real consensus is not the sending ambition until, uh, until such point that everyone signs, is to act together in the interest of everyone, which means that you get 70% of the pie and I get 30%, and next, the next time is the other way around. That is consensus. If you have been taught otherwise, I disagree. So if we only would learn to be together and use consensus properly, I think we would make giant leaps. The second accelerator is tech and knowledge put together. Ambassador mentioned it. Technology at its peak, combined with the knowledge we have, can create a new form of wisdom that we've never seen before. I'm absolutely convinced of that. The third is value-based leadership. What is leadership? That's another 20 minutes. You may have all the definitions you want. I'll give you one. Leadership is what is not around right now. The fourth accelerator is urgency. You may take urgency as a negative, and climate change is a negative. I may seem crazy to you again. It's a blessing in disguise. Because we are programmed to react. The human species is programmed to react. You need to feel pain to go to your dentist. You feel to have cholesterol before you cut on eggs. This is us. So this feeling of urgency can be leveraged by you, the new series of experts, and say, let's use it to throttle up, accelerate. Now I want to conclude by giving you some final thoughts that this is my present to you to send you on your, on your journey. I'll be there watching. I won't be there when you succeed, maybe. I'll be watching you. And so the first final thought for you is, is to be worried. You need to be worried. But you need to be optimistic. So you need to be worried, but you need to go to work as you went. Coolness. Yeah? And so you have to make a conscious decision to be optimistic. Because what you read every day in the press doesn't lead you to that. So you have to make a conscious choice. The other choice I would like you to make is multilateralism. Choose multilateralism. Not because it's under attack and it needs your protection. Not because it's there because, some, because nationalism is on the rise. Look in your history books. It's never been so low. It was much worse in the 20s. You choose it because it's the obvious thing to do. It's the wisest choice. So you choose it and you fight for it. The third is to be aware all the time. Be aware where you are in history. We are in, the, in, in, in this century, in a new millennium, and we're still defining history with the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War. Are you sure that is a good matrix? Be aware where you are. We are in a new era. And um, this happened before. And every time it happened, it dawns, this new era dawns, and we realize by midday, sometimes even 2 o'clock. The, the fourth and final is that things move much faster than when I was sitting there instead of you. Um, much, much faster. Everyone can tell you that. And so when all these people discourse is about waking up, I tell you it's no longer, the challenge is not to wake up. The challenge, ladies and gentlemen, is that you get out of bed and to work, because we're already up, but we have to get out of bed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, what shall I say, refreshing, stimulating, um, 
refreshing we needed it because it's climate uh, global warming <laughs> yeah. perfect simulation Thank so you. reminding <laughs> us of our conscious in all these uh, mm. situations so um, our speaker uh, accepted to take a few questions so it's uh, time to open the discussion um, who would like to start with a question may I just ask the person to present to introduce herself or briefly and Jan take the floor. Who would like to start? I, I spoke also longer, so even without questions, it's fine. Here on my right, Hadi. Um, um, good evening, um, and thank you for your presentation. I'm Ms. Nehadi Jeng. I'm the Deputy Head of Mission at the Gambia Embassy in Brussels and I was part of the first um, cohort of the MEIG program in 2017. Mm. Um, I, I just want to thank you for a very insightful presentation. And I, I like the reference you made to the SDGs and how it is sort of like a problem solving for now and for the future. Um, but I just want to say that um, in, in reality, I seem to think that um, it's good that there was consensus for the SDGs but in reality, it seems that there is differences, huge differences, that is, in the prioritization of on what needs to be solved now and for the future for different countries around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think this is impacted by the level of growth, economic and financial growth of these countries. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to know from your perspective, what do you think is the role of globalization in, in determining for, especially for developing countries, what needs prioritization <laughs> now? Mm. Because my analysis, very humbly, is the fact that I feel that to a certain extent, multilateralism and globalization sometimes um, impacts in a negative way how countries react to res resolving the problems in their home countries, mm. uh, prioritizing what needs to be done now. For some of these countries, it is giving ordinary jobs to the, to the, to the people and preventing migration and all of those things. And where there are policies outside which are impacting government, then it becomes difficult for the government to take necessary action. So in very short, my question is, how do you think globalization is impacting what developing countries especially are prioritizing to resolve for mm -hmm. now and for the future? Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you agree, we may collect one or two questions. Um, yes, please. Here at the back. Uh, hi, I am an internet wiper. I'm from Zimbabwe. Uh, I have a question for, it was a wonderful presentation, very thought provoking and engaging and insightful. Uh, my question relates to the role of multilateralism when it comes to negotiations and the context of the needs of countries. Uh, there's been a growth, so to speak, of plurilateral agreements, especially on very difficult issues around uh, trade. And I think when we look at it, it has worked. And I think it's good that there's a platform of agreement. But going forward, interests are kind of diverging. And on the short end of the stick is those countries that don't have the power to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So I just want your thoughts on how best to reconcile that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any other question here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one maybe a bit boring and politically more correct one, mm -hmm. and the other one is actually very much in line with what ladies before me were asking. So the first one is more general, uh, speaking about the future uh, in the time when we're experiencing the transition yeah, of multilateralism. Uh, how do you see uh, the new actors coming into play with, into this uh, mm -hmm. multilater multilateralism in transition given that the distribution of influences and power is also uh, changing, mm -hmm. starting from the sectors, finishing with the countries? That's the question okay. number one. And uh, the question number two relates a little bit or reflects a little bit more on your speech. You are speaking about uh, many points and I was trying to take uh, some notes because there were some really inspiring ones. You're talking about the era of uh, post-globalization. I'm trying to make a difference versus the globalism, as you, uh, as you mentioned. And you, you say fairly so, because during the globalization, there were very clear beneficiaries of it who are actually still 
reaping the benefit of wild globalization, yeah? And they are the rich who are getting richer. Mm. How about the poor who are getting poorer mm. in the expense of those who are getting rich, yeah? Uh, and is everybody really need to pay the price in the same way? Are we really, really meaning it when we're looking up to that vision that you're talking about with uh, SDG 2030 agenda, yeah? That we don't want to have po poverty? Does really ev everybody want to sign off? Because we see ne negotiations, for example, on trade, when you have different powers sitting in the room, uh, starting from very well-respected European Union, finishing with uh, maybe a less known in the world uh, countries, who is saying we need to find, fight, or actually we need to stop climate change. Mm. And for that, we need to preserve our natural resources, mm. for example, forests. Mm -hmm. And uh, dear country X, thank you very much for growing beautiful forests. Please don't take them out, but buy woods at our prices. Mm. And, and the question the is, question is <laughs> how do we deal with that? Sorry? How do we deal with that? And how do we hold accountable yeah. those countries and actors which have profited from the globalization, globalism, or globalization yeah. era uh, in the time when it was possible? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, maybe we I should maybe start with, yeah. with this round of questions. Yes. Um, I'll try to be brief. When do you want me to stop this? Because this is good, huh? <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's first, first, you, man, the, 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 the diplomat from, from the mission in Brussels. The, the, there is, we have a system that still looks mainly, gives space to negotiating on the basis, on the assumption that national priorities come on top of the list of priorities that each and every member state goes to the agora with. Okay. Now, these national priorities are in two categories. Those that, when achieved, consume global resources. For example, the air, the quality of the air. I remember when I studied European law in the early 80s, that there was no such notion as transboundary. transboundary. So you pollute in your country, I keep my alpine region clean. You know, so the first category is priorities that when achieved consume resources. And now we know that the resources are finite and they, they, they are going, they are going, if you produce carbon in, 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 the, in the east, there are consequences also in, in the west. Now, there, the, the other priorities are conflicting priorities, are priorities that to be achieved each country has to enter in a negotiation game which is win or lose. Win or lose. And so I get all the water in the river, you get none. Okay? I build the dam, I get electricity, you get uh, drought. Now, th these things are not conducive to realizing a multilateralist that looks at global issues because we produce global issues by chasing domestic strategic priorities. And so this is a vicious circle. So how do you get out of the circle? Well, you get out with courage. You get out by being the first country that says, I have decided that the first three priorities of my country are actually global issues. How do you deal with that now? So say. My priority is to save the oceans. We're not that far. There are countries who are talking like that. They're talking. It's still talk, but we're getting there. So it's not a complete answer to your question, because actually embedded in Agenda 2030, there is another issue that is the political declaration of principles. So we believe, we imagine a world in which this and this will become true. And so on the way, we need to pay the cost. You know very well as a diplomat that the most difficult part of, of, uh, of the Agenda 2030 realization is actually how do we pay for it. And if I told you that every year private people like us produce 10 trillion US dollars in current value of private savings, and that is more than enough to finance Agenda 2030 in full. So it's not a question of money. It's a question of letting go of perceived domestic priorities. And you know where the anchor is? Because your people will not elect you if you tell them my priority is to save the oceans. That's the true problem to solve inside countries first. 
the WIPO colleague. Hi. Um, you know, what, what you said made me think of something. You remember the list of multilateral is not, is not, is not. The other thing that multilateral is not is for quick results. Multilateralism is for long-term solutions in the making. And that's why the old architecture is failing us, because there is the catch of the time acceleration. If we had had the foresight and intelligence to start this discussion back in the 60s, instead of building increasingly bigger cars and go chasing the moon and all that old things, um, look at that generation, please. And then we would not have the catch of time acceleration, but now we have it. And so multilateralism is designed for long-term solutions. If you look for quick gains, you don't use multilateralism, you use other methods. Um, Nadia, your, your questions one, one and two. You ask how new players come into play. I ask right. how do you, well, the first one, uh, how yeah. do you build the multilateralism with the new players? Well, it's, you see, you can, you can visualize it like this. It's a question of ports. So you remember the first computers when they didn't have the USB ports. And not. You do? No, you do? <laughs> okay. I can tell you it was horrible. But it wasn't horrible before the mouse was invented. When the mouse came about, it came with this thing, the plug. And all of a sudden, all the computers became old. There was nothing wrong with the computers. It was the mouse. So when you have, let's say, 80 million youth, the ghost in the room, youth, all the old people talk about youth, nobody hears the, the, the youth voice, that's the mouse. So, seen from the UN, do we have the port? Do we have the port? Because we, if we don't, either we become super old immediately and they go plug it somewhere else, maybe in the World Economic Forum, have you thought about that? Or we rush to the supermarket, buy the goddamn port, install it and say, you can come here and talk to me. So this is how. It's a conscious decision. I wish for a UN whose member states come to work in the morning and say, where is the port for the youth in this organization? Where is the port for the fishermen in the Pacific Islands? And so on and so forth. It's just a question of talking. We talked with everybody. That's what the UN is. It's a question of hardware design. Now, how do we hold people accountable? Well, that's a, that's a question. Uh, how do we hold st well, states? states that profited accountable. Yes. Yeah. More than the states that did not profit and now have to suffer. Yeah. Business. What is your bachelor? Law? No, my bachelor is actually business. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> my bachelor is constitutional law. <laughs> there is only one entity that can keep states accountable. In law, it is a supranational entity to which the countries have submitted themselves before. Okay, yeah, but it doesn't work. What works, the only thing that works is the states hold one another accountable. Wait, wait, wait. I'm teaching you. You're listening. <laughs> so, how does it happen? It, remember the pact? It happens because what is lacking is value based leadership leading the pact into a togetherness on certain values. And then, when we decided that we all go that way, if she started go, walking back and say, hey, what are you doing? Today, because there's no, the, the far vision is not there and there's no leadership, when you walk backwards, you say, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing the same thing you did five years ago in the other country. Do you have a problem with that? So this is what is changing. It has already changed in the discourse, but we need to put it into practice. So it's a question of moral courage. So the answer to your question is a little bit pessimistic. Only state can rise to the challenge of having this togetherness. It wasn't the idea of the UN, but it was referred to no more war. And basically, the agreement was only that. But it happened. They agreed. No more war. This is the charter. So we can do it again and say no more poverty. Okay. I think there's a pressing question here on my right. Pressing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. My name is Cole McDougall Hunter. I'm a former UN staff member, so I won't um, be too conspirationalist. But you um, said two words which I think are terribly important. Dark power. 
you uttered them and then you water skied over yeah. onto <laughs> other things. Um, I thought that was very interesting in the context of today, even yesterday. I come from a country who I'm ashamed to be a member of, uh, the UK, uh, and you know why, because I'm saying this, and you come from a, a country which is going through the same throes of uh, democratic problems. Oh, they're getting better, I think. <laughs> yeah. My question is, do you, are you not really worried about uh, dark power, um, AI, um, manipulation um, versus the power of SDGs? Of course I believe in SDGs. Everything you said was excessively thought-provoking, and I thank you very much for raising all these issues, and I am an optimist. But I'm also a pessimist because I find that Optimism can lead to naive, naivety. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. this case, I, am, I don't want to be too naive because mm -hmm. otherwise my country is going to be dominated by um, dark power in the form of people like Mercer. It is a strategy in the UK to hate, to get people to hate each other and to dominate the elections. And basically they will take over with an agenda which is maximizing profit to hell with the environment to hell with your inequalities. Sorry about this, but uh, Mr. Muller, don't, don't kill me afterwards. Don't stop my pension. <laughs> but to hell with everything that the UN believes in, rightly. But that is what um, really worries me. Leadership and the press. I'm extremely wary of what the press says, because once you dominate the press, you get into the minds of people. Do you not think it's a danger? Thank you. Excuse me, while you have the microphone, are you asking me whether I think the press is a danger? No, dark yeah. power and the press and everybody at the... Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, um, I think you said something uh, equally important, uh, dear colleague. Um, you said, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a pessimist. That is the best form of optimism, I know. So that is very important. Be, it's what I told you before. Be worried, but act as you weren't. He's a, what's, what's, what's a pessimist? He's a well-informed optimist. Yeah? He's a well-informed optimist. Um, this is the Anglo-Saxon tradition of realism. I'm an idealist. And I also, beside that, I know a couple of things. Dark power. It's like, you know, out of a Spider-Man movie f phrase, dark power. But look at how, no, don't look at the power. Look at how it works. And it works like this. A lot of energy, a lot of collusions, etc., etc., to intervene on point A. Here, now, this war, this region. And then look at what happens when you gather the whole might of that power and you slam it on the table and in reality is down here. No longer there, down here. And you have in front of you a 16 years old calling the bluff. And so that power doesn't scare me because he's hammering a nail always a step behind me. And if he worked that well, we would have been screwed long ago, I think. Hmm. Uh, the press and dark power together, I'm not an expert uh, on press. Um, I'm not an expert on press. I think there is constructive press around. I think the press is written by humans so far, uh, and some of them are um, allies of this ideal of new multilateralism. Actually, there was a, a Financial Times journalist who wrote last week a new kind of multilateralism on the horizon. And there was a photo of Jack Ma and Melinda Gates on it. I'm not saying this ironically. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you very much. I have to close the discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, because we have to move to the to serious matters um, and the uh, distribution of the diploma. But we will start not with the general distribution of the diploma, but with the prize, because we created uh, three years ago a prize, the MEIG Prize Geneva International 2019. 
and our sponsor for this prize is Bome Merci. Mrs. Uh, Schwartz is unfortunately not with us, but her thoughts are with us, actually, and mine. So you have here the concept of these, um, uh, of these prize. So the idea is uh, that Bome Merci and fine watchmaking embodies immutable values. So we strive for excellence while never compromising on quality. This is also words for the university, uh, for the organization that works, of course, for all of us. So I, I'm not going to read this. So we are very pleased that uh, we have this prize, which is uh, now attributed every year. And for this year, uh, so the prize goes always for the highest average grade uh, of the uh, participant of the court, so for the best uh, uh, average. And this year, the prize goes to Yasmin uh, Idrisi Azuzi. So, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. I, I truly appreciate this, um, especially as the youngest participant of this edition. I think with this prize, we also recognize the importance of betting on young people, uh, especially in this era, as mentioned uh, by Dr. Pisano, where we need fresh, imaginative uh, approaches to post globalization. I wish to thank the University of Geneva and the MEIG program for not only providing a platform for academic excellence, but a space for personal growth. Also, I must say a couple of words to thank my parents, without whom I wouldn't be here. Uh, thank you for your endless love, support, and continuous. <laughs> and uh, continuous push to grow and be ambitious. So thank you so much. Uh, congrats to the 2019 edition of the MEIG program, and thank you all. You are forgetting the price, uh, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> well, good. So uh, now we are going to proceed to the uh, award of the diploma, and um, we are. Um, going to share this uh, task and uh, Philippe Han, the, um, the, the coordinator of the program, is going to name uh, the graduate and uh, Mrs. Tamara Guerrero is going to join us as well for, for this, also the MEIG team. Here we are, and as you see, it's the Kofi Annan promotion for this third edition. We should start, you have to name. First, micro, micro. First one tonight is Mr. Kamal Ben Saida. Miss Juliana Cicci. <laughs> Mr. Amine Esamaki. Our next participant is not here. We will Nonetheless, uh, honor him, Mr. Miguel Ferres Rodriguez Filo. <laughs> Miss Ayushi Malika Gupta. <laughs> Mr. Sayed Nuruddin Hashemi.
Mr. Syed Nuruddin Hashemi. <laughs> Mr. Walter Hubbard Heron. <laughs> Ms. Yasmin Idrisi Asuth. Miss Natalia, Natalia Koslenkova. <laughs> Mr. Tresor Gautier Kalonji. Mr. Emilian Mustak is not here today, but we would like to honor him as well. <laughs> Ms. Yesha Rahul. His Excellency, Mr. Barrett Salato. <laughs> Mr. Willie Franklin Chen. <laughs> Mr. Aidin Topchu. Finally, Miss Nadia Yeremenko. Thank you, sir. This is for the distribution of the of the diploma. So congratulations to all of you uh, once again. There is a wish of two of the participants of this year to say a couple of words here to the audience. So please, Nadia and Kamal. <laughs> <laughs> Excellencies. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is truly an honor to be invited to speak to an audience of your stature, diversity. Please allow me to introduce myself. Kamal bin Zaida, it went off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Freshly, a master's degree holder in European and international governance. When I was asked by the head of the program, Professor Kadu, to whom I remain eternally grateful and indebted to deliver a speech. I was, I was honestly anxious. I was thinking, what could I possibly say to ambassadors, highly proficient diplomats, well-known scholars, and for students, to students, to whom only the sky is the limit. What could I possibly say that they don't already know? And then I got inspired by a superpower, imagination. <laughs> I figured out that only the truth can save me. The words, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm about to utter are a token of love from heart to heart and the testimony of knowledge transfer from mind to mind. 
allow me to start first with knowledge transfer. I can never repay what the University of Geneva and the MAKE program offered me through a plethora of extraordinary professors and practitioners from different countries and different fields of expertise who humbly opened up to us, embraced us, and professionally showed us the way and agreed to share their knowledge with us. Only now I came to realize how the MAKE journey changed me, changed us MAKE students. It taught me to see life through the lens of method and governance, and, the, and that we can all be agents of change, and that change does not happen in silos. I wouldn't say that I learned, but I shall rather confess that I lived in a make world where nothing was impossible where inertia was not an option, where failure was deleted from our glossary, and where discipline and cross-cutting knowledge were our only roadmap and lingua franca. A world where I witnessed how ideas could mute from a belief into a credo and from a rule into a lifestyle on the whole, and in order not to step into other people's time, it is also a message of love, I remind you, ladies and gentlemen. Because when I will go back to my home country, I will look back at, my, at this experience with fond reminiscence and a grin on my face for all the love and knowledge that I was fortunate enough to receive from this welcoming university and international village that simply became my second home. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Dear Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, dear faculty, dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, after Kamal's speech, uh, I'm not sure that uh, I will be able to keep, keep up to that level of uh, dramatism and a tear in the eye. But also Kamal is coming from a very highly diplomatic community. I'm coming from a slightly different background, private sector. We are more down to earth. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm also uh, privileged to be a class speaker of uh, MEAG edition 2019 in the name of Kofi Annan. My name is Nadia. And uh, I'm here today actually, first of all, to congratulate the class that I'm being part of with the graduation. We did it. Congratulations. Good for us. And uh, thank you. And it was a great, great, great honor and great pleasure to meet all of you and to get to know all of you with all the diversity that we represent from Latin America to Africa to Solomon Islands, where I hope I will be one day for maybe a vacation or something else, if Barrett invites us someday, finally. <laughs> uh, and actually also from very diverse professional background, from public sector, we have people from international organizations, from NGOs. We have uh, people from civil society, we have uh, people from private sector, myself being one of them. And um, I'm very happy to be here with you today. Secondly, uh, and secondly by the number and not by the order of priority in my life, I'm very grateful today to uh, have an opportunity to have my parents here with me, both of them here, and for the support of my family. Мама, папа, большое спасибо, что вы приехали. Я очень вам рада. And third, by the number of priority, I have a list here, not as sophisticated, again, as Kamal, but also helping me. Uh, but also from the number, uh, I would like to thank on behalf of EMIG edition uh, 2019, 
to our distinguished faculty, to Professor Caduce, who has uh, <laughs> who has uh, taught us the basis of European law and who has given us a tremendous amount of effort and her personal soul for us to be able to be here today, who organized the program for us in a very peculiar way. Thank so, you, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> uh, dear Ambassador Giga, our father, godfather, Thank you very much for teaching us, and please come if you can here, if, if, you, if you can. Uh, we would like to thank you for giving us uh, uh, your kind uh, governance knowledge and experience and for supporting us throughout all this uh, year. It has been a real pleasure to be with you here. Thank you. And we hope that you, you will be remembering us with uh, a little bit of uh, joy and warmth from Havana. <laughs> now we can say this word, right, in diplomatic community? You can. Even. <laughs> um, we also wanted to thank Professor Levra, who is not here with us today, hopefully not because of his uh, uh, explanation of Catalan communities and Spain peculiarities, <laughs> but we uh, also would like to pass uh, our thanks and uh, for, for his uh, support and for his knowledge uh, in uh, multilateral diplomacy and uh, the UN structure. Uh, we also wanted to thank Tamara, and uh, I, I'm not sure where, where she, is she here today? I can't see her. Uh, but anyway, Tamara, <laughs> thank you so much for being our administrative help and support, uh, for replying to all of our urgent last moment requests. Uh, please, uh, yeah, this is our small, uh, recognition that we could uh, give. Thank you. And uh, and dear Philip, you have joined us a, a little bit later, but you have become a strong ally in all the negotiations and, and diplomas, defense and support, etc. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you, and we have also a little small something for you to help you out maybe with the next edition. <laughs> we also would like to pass our special thanks to another uh, coordinator that was with us most of the year, actually. Now she is uh, doing a, a great job as a UN volunteer in a warmer community yeah, in Congo, uh, and uh, she has been now a really supporting soul, uh, Ljubljana. Uh, unfortunately, she's not here with us today, but uh, we really hope that she will get our thanks and greetings. So I'm going to, I was also asked to share a little bit of an experience of my year, so I'm going to do that very quickly, since I've taken, taken already a lot of time, but I prepared a bit of a speech. <laughs> <laughs> and in all honesty, the year uh, that I started, that I passed, had here, uh, during the pro program was really uh, a year of personal and professional growth and transformation. And both the six months of lectures and the six months of uh, preparation to defense of the diploma uh, have been different but really invaluable lessons. If we would look back into the program during the six months of the lectures, I felt like I really added to my ability to orient in the EU legislation, in UN architecture, in cross-sectoral cooperations around the SDG 2030 agenda, and even more importantly, what actually that agenda is, really not what I thought. Uh, and it also enabled me to better understand all the different um, sensitivities and multi-sidedness of negotiation processes uh, for peace negotiations. And I thank uh, especially Professor uh, Ambassador Giga for giving me a quick course <laughs> on geopolitics. It will stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, and um, the six months of preparing to uh, defend the diploma has reminded me of an old Russian joke, which I wanted to tell here, but then, you know, didn't pass the peer review, so I have to leave it out for those who will join the dinner, if you would like to. <laughs> On a more serious note, actually, when I was preparing uh, my defense uh, of the diploma, I realized that 
coming from private sector and doing the diploma on actually role of uh, uh, media actors in the process of global governance, there is no area of work that functions without proper governance. So for recognizing and understanding the principles of establishing this governance around pretty much any area and problem with all the relevant actors on international, national, and sub-national <laughs> levels of governance. <laughs> I'm very, very deeply grateful to dear faculty for teaching me and for dear class for learning together with me. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I just want uh, one more thing of the participants here, just to join here for the group photo and the guests, of course, the guests or the speakers here, if we can uh, just join all of us over there. And uh, may I ask Mr. Muller, our godfather of the program, to join us. <laughs> here as well. Yes. Benedict, you too, and Lydia and Yannick, everybody. Yes. So we have to... Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation to this graduation ceremony. Last but not least, I would like also to thank all the participants here this evening, uh, our speakers, our dean, uh, the university, our uh, faculty members, there are uh, teachers, professors uh, in the MEIG program with us also tonight. Thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you also for the MEIG team, for Margot, for Philippe, Tamara, and the uh, Center of for European Legal Studies team as well. Thank you to all of you for having this uh, made uh, possible tonight. And with these words, I close the graduation ceremony 2019. Thank you.